Kalima, and uh, I'm sure now uh, my face is very familiar to you. And uh, today's lecture is uh, number uh, number three, our uh, our third lecture. And uh, today's lecture is about the methods and approaches we use or you can use when you are doing any uh, creative translation. Um, <clears throat> as usual. Um, I always state my uh, my objectives or the out, the learning outcomes you are supposed uh, to achieve. Not, I mean, not me. This is for you, you know. So my main my main objective of this lecture is to enable you and help you achieve the following learning outcomes. Uh, you should be able to show knowledge of a number of strategies used in translating literary texts. And you should be able to apply these strategies when you are doing any creative translation. You know? So, uh, you need to ask yourself by the end of the lecture, can I do that? Can I explain what I have studied today? You know? So, uh, these are just guidelines for you to, uh, to follow when you are learning something. All right, now, regarding approaches and strategies and uh, methods uh, used in, uh, in the translation in general, uh, there are, what I would say, I mean, there are so many approaches, so many strategies, so many methods, um, but when it comes down to uh, a translation, uh, to the translating creative writing, um, people have different views. Now, the first type or the first approach to translating um, creative translation or creative writing um, is suggested by David Bendelbury. Um, he says, look, we have two recognizable main stages. I mean, there are two stages when you are translating um, any text or any literary text, whether it is a poetry or a drama or novel or or uh, or um, or, uh, or a sacred sacred text. We will we will come to that next lecture, inshallah. Um, you need to think of two stages. Stage number one: you have a poem. You have a text, a short story, a novel, whatever. You have a text in front of you. Firstly, you need to produce a draft translation of the original. That is accurate and literal as possible, as much as possible. So you translate as literal and as accurate as possible. When you are doing that, of course, there will be some kind of, uh, of holes, gap uh, 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 gaping uh, holes and pitfalls. You are not happy about this translation. I know. First stage. And this stage, you leave it aside. For, for, from my own experience, you leave it aside and you say, all right. You reflect. And you say, okay, what kind of gaps or gapping hole or misconception, uh, misconceptions or, uh, or gaps or any pitfalls you missed or you misunderstood? So this is stage number one. Then you move to stage number two. What is it? You see, we then or you then translate the draft. You don't really refer to the original any longer. Just, just a bit, you know, to, to double check certain items or, uh, or certain uh, words and so on. So, you have the original here, the first draft here, and now stage number two, you are doing, you are translating what? Not the original, you are translating the draft. You are making amends, you are modifying, you are 
polishing. You are, you know, uh, trying to what we say. I mean, he, this, um, uh, this guy. I mean, this. What's his name? Pendlebury uh, suggests the word weaning away. Weaning away. It's like uh, a baby weans away from uh, breastfeeding. You know, yaftum wakannaka taf wakannaka taftum nafsaka an al asl. Bimana and you refer to the draft. You don't refer to the original. So this, then, you can feel that the second, this one, the second uh, version of your translation is getting shape, and it becomes uh, more uh, acceptable, probably more uh, readable, more creative, more creative, and in. In all, in on all, uh, uh, it is, a, it is a good translation. So he suggests two stages. You might agree, you might disagree. I leave it to you. But this is one way of doing translation, one method, one approach to translating creative writing. Okay. Now we move to uh, the, an example. Look at this example. Now this, exp uh, this excerpt taken from a, sh a story written by an Nuaimi and you can see the difference between versions A and B. Why? Because when I, two people, two people translated this. A, somebody, not me, someone, and B, I translated B to give you as an to give you an example how you uh, translate um, uh, uh, a draft uh, first you make a translation a draft look this one this one is the original okay the Arabic one is the original a the or the Arabic one says كان يوما ملتهبا كطفل نالت منه الحمى الشارع الإسفلتي عربيد أسود ضل طريقه أما الشجيرات على جانب الطريق فقد كانت تلهث لأن هناك من نسي من نسي أرواءها الغبار حناء تناثرت في المكان لتصبغ حتى ثناياه. Now look at at the red here. Look at the red. Now the student the student translated the first line as it was a very hot afternoon as the child experienced the heat of a fever. Now let's take this bit, only this bit. It was a very hot afternoon. Why did she say afternoon? Why didn't he say uh, uh, it, was, it was a very hot day? And the child experienced the heat of a fever. This is one way of doing it. But does it sound English? You, should, you could ask yourself. Is it really new? Is it really accurate? Is it really appropriate? Is it really imaginative? You need to ask yourself. Now look at the second example. Okay? It was a scorching summer afternoon. The feverish heat of the day made people stay indoors. The street was as quiet as a mouse in the locker room. It was a scorching summer afternoon. Here, the translator added the word summer. Why? Because, and scorching, scorching, scorching is is stronger than hot you know there is a difference between you are working in the street uh, for instance uh, you are you are in in uh, in Riyadh for instance is different from when you are in Riyadh or in the Mam than when you are in this in the desert you say it was really hot this afternoon but you are in you are in Al Hasa you are in Riyadh, you are in Jeddah, and so on and so forth. But when you go to 
outside the cities into the desert, you say, gosh, it was really scorching hot. Very strong word, very strong word. So you need to be, to, you to be able to come up, to, to come up with really new words, good words, but relevant and appropriate. And again, the feverish heat. You can say, uh, 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 with the feverish heat of the day, made people stay indoors. It is you need to be, you need to take into account that you are, you are right, you are translating a story, you know, and you need to create this storytelling or this narrative style into your translation. You need to be really, you need to make it attractive, um, you know, catchy, you know, you catch the attention of the reader. Um, I know the, الشارع الإسفلتي عربيد أسود ضل طريقه. If you translate it literally, عربيد, you know, so you need to be creative in the sense that the metaphor, the metaphor is that the street was as quiet as, as I mean, it was really deadly quiet. Here, the street was as quiet as a mouse in the locker room. Imagine yourself that you have a locker, uh, you have a little room, and you get into the room, and there is a mouse, a, a mouse, and, you know, this mouse uh, gets really quiet. So th this is an example. This is an idiom in English to show you that it is it is really dead quiet all right so this is an example of how you use two two stages stage one this is the original stage one this is the draft and this is then second stage a better one all right so we move to uh, uh, another type of uh, approach you can use when you are translating creatively and uh, and uh, you need to really um, so many I mean people uh, use different approaches different methods they uh, uh, and when you are translating you know um, you need to be able to um, uh, see whether you can translate the whole the whole the whole uh, uh, image of the text into really a very nice image now in this case you need to check the um, the outside and the inside for translating poetry for example uh, the the kernel and the sh and the shell you know the shell of in other words you need to look at translating a literary text a, a, in a holistic uh, way in other words you take you look you look at it uh, uh, from uh, a poetic point of view from a linguistic point of view from a stylistic point of view uh, or from a cultural point of view or from a literary point of view and you use all these elements to come up with a proper and appropriate translation so uh, you take into account as well the aesthetic coherence I mean your translation should be coherent beautifully coherent it's not only you uh, uh, you uh, you highlight highlight the uh, the interrelationship of of elements inside a poem it means the holisticness of the poem but you need to be aware of the coherence you know the coherence of uh, 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 of the uh, of the poem or of the text now look at this ha huh. again i mean this is i mean we have said this but i i've used this to give you a, to give it as an example to you again about the holistic approach to translation here here number one a b c uh one version second version third version then the numbers d i use the holistic approach to translating poetry in other words i try to embrace the content and the form of the poem 
I've tried to uh, uh, to uh, to in, uh, to integrate the stylistic uh, features of the poem, whether it is uh, the rhyme of the poem or the versification of the poem. So you need to look at it as an aesthetic piece of of uh, of information or 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 text. So this is an example of looking at the text in a holistic approach, in a holistic way uh, 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 of translation. Now, uh, there are uh, other approaches to translating uh, creative writing. And Andre Lefevre uh, has got about an approach which consists of seven, imagine, seven strategies and, uh, and a blueprint to examine and compare the strengths and weaknesses different approach might have. I mean, he would say, okay, when I'm translating a literary text, whether poetry, novel, story, or whatever, I need to really look into the following elements. The ST means the source language, and the phonemic unit, the, the phonemes of the unit, of the expression, and then I need to look at the literal meaning and the meter and the rhyme of the ST. And then I have to use all this information when I'm doing it and translating into, uh, into another, uh, 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 um, another uh, language or another genre or another type of text. It means into the uh, target language. Now, when you are doing translating English poetry into Arabic poetry, it's not easy, by the way, to, uh, to transfer it into, um, into poetry. So he is suggesting that some people translate poetry into prose. Now, how to translate poetry into prose, this is a little example to show you. You know, this poem originally was written originally in, uh, in Japanese or, and then translated into English and then translated into Arabic. Now, when I take the path to Targos coast, I see perfect whiteness laid on Mount Fuji's lofty peak by the drift of falling snow. Now, the Arabic translation here, you know, it is, it is prose. عندما آخذ الطريق إلى شاطئ إلى شاطئ تاجو أرى غطاء أبيض يوشحه الكمال على قمة جبل فيوج السامقة صنعه الثلج المتساقط المنتوف. Now some of you might say, oh well, Dr. حليمة, I can really reword this and I can do probably better. Why not? You know. You could really be, you could really do better. Why not? Now, another prose, I mean, it came up with me like, I mean, this is not my translation, by the way. As I said, this is Anwaini's translation. Now, I have translated before, I, I translated it, I, I, have, I translated it in a different way on my way to the studio. And I would like to listen to me, I would like you to listen to another version of it, uh, which, which says, على الطريق إلى شاطئ تاغو غطاء أبيض جميل من ثلج منتوف على قمة جبل فوج العالية. This is a second way of translating it, but again, it is prose. It's not poetry. Okay. Now. Uh, there is, there is another way of looking at, uh, 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 there is another um, uh, type of uh, approach to translating um, uh, creative writing. I mean, uh, Paz looks at translation as both bilingual, uh, bilingual and a bicultural activity. In other words, you need to translate uh, 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 um, a text, you need to look at it uh, from the linguistic point of view and from a cultural point of view. 
it's not it's not language only you need to look at it as uh, you know uh, uh, from a cultural point of view this is very important to be aware of so especially literature literature is full full of cultural connotations and associations now very quickly I've chosen probably I don't know whether you have heard of this example or not before but this is an example to show you the relationship between uh, you know uh, language and culture and the effect of cultural connotations on translation now uh, what we say Shakespeare has written this this uh, this poem shall I compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate this is just a couplet it's the two lines now Fatma and Naib she was a poetess and she was qualified to translate you know probably I mean it's obvious that she knew some English and look how she translated it she translated it uh, into Arabic of course she's, she's trying to translate it into poetry she said من ذا يقارن حسنك المغري بصيف قد تجلى وفنون سحرك قد باتت في ناظري أسمى وأغلى It sounds fine It rhymes It is, it is uh, uh, probably موزون You know, according to our Arabic العروض uh, 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 موزوني But I don't know whether you agree with me or not that she has made a very serious mistake the mistake she has made has killed the message Shakespeare wants to pass to the reader she used a saif now do you know that the connotation of summer in English is different from the connotation of summer in the Gulf or even in the, in the Arab world now look English summer is a, sim is a symbol of beauty and liveliness. Arabic summer, it is not a symbol of beauty and liveliness. No way. Even in Lebanon, where, you know, it's really cold and blah, blah, blah. No. But we are talking now about, you know, the, uh, uh, the Gulf states. A huge area. The uh, summer... The summer is not a symbol of beauty and liveliness. Now, the summer is very hot, uh, one to two months, very short, sorry. The summer in England is very short, one, two months. Look, the summer in, for instance, in the Gulf states or in Saudi Arabia between three, four months. And the, the English summer is cool and temperate. The summer in Saudi Arabia is dry, humid, and hot. Now, the summer in Britain has positive uh, psychological effect the summer in uh, in the Gulf states has a negative psychological effect in other words in let's say in August I mean it's really really hot and people stay indoors you know uh, uh, running away from the sunshine therefore what you need to do here if I if I was uh, an, a naib uh, I would have translated it into Arabia now if I were her listen I would have translated it as من ذا يقارن حسنك المغري بربيع قد تجلى وفنون سحرك قد باتت في ناظري أسمى وأغلى Now the word ربيع is of course much better than a saif You as Arabic native speakers you enjoy a ربيع and this word ربيع gives you uh, so much uh, emotions so much uh, effects so much uh, influence upon you you know so you need to be aware of this therefore look Eng English um, we go to the um, uh, English summer is equivalent to Arabic spring English summer symbol of beauty and liveliness Arabic spring symbol of beauty and liveliness English summer very short one two months Arabic, Arabic spring very short one to two months English summer cool and temperate, Arabic spring cool and temperate, and English summer positive psychological effect, and and uh, Arabic spring positive and psychological effect. You know, 
So I hope that you have got the message now and and and, uh, and uh, grasp the meaning of uh, some method and approaches to translation. And before we finish off the uh, 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 the seminar or the lecture, I I would like you to translate practical uh, lecture number three. Uh, this poem from English into Arabic and then we you have another one translate the following excerpts from a short story into English use your uh, creative ability in your translation please 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 uh, translate it please translate it please translate it you need to practice you need to practice you need to practice because most of the questions I w will come from the lectures here the slides and the uh, lectures uh, that uh, inshallah will be attached to the uh, to the slides later on okay so i would like to thank you very much and i hope that you have benefited from this lecture and uh, i wish you all the best and uh, uh, thank you thank you and goodbye